あつしさんは日本語でちょっとちょっとインドを話してくださいと言いましたじゃあはじめましてレイトサリですイギリスに住んでいるからデブルコン東京は少し便利じゃないでも日本が大好きですよろしくお願いします。So hello everybody. ありがとうございます。怖いかった。First of all,、um, just thank you so much for inviting me to speak. It's a real, real honour to be here. I'm, I'm so pleased、um, to get to speak to you today. And、um, I'm glad that Alex, if you didn't、um, hear him, he asked the whole room earlier who actually works in DevRel. And not everybody put their hand up. And I'm glad that that was the case because. I,、um, I feel like a bit of an imposter because I don't work as、uh, a DevRel person.、Um, but a lot of what I do is basically that under another name. So, my background was that I started off as a developer originally,、um, but I do now run a small consultancy、uh, company in the UK. And I do all kinds of things, but it's basically to help people evolve their relationship with the web and digital technologies and help them find new ways of working, new opportunities. And working well with developers is such a big part of that. So, most of my projects are actually pretty contained in scope、um, and they look to solve a particular problem. So, for instance,、um, I've worked with a big charity in the UK、um, to do things like defining their technical standards and how they choose technology and keep you up to date with、uh, the, you know, the pace of change and, and what can be out there. And、uh, I did a, a project for a Formula One team, which was really fun. Help them look at their manufacturing process and how digital can actually、um, bring improvements. But I also do stuff like training and coaching and workshops、um, and general things like that. But those kind of projects are typically、um, a little bit easier than what I want to talk to you about today, which is trying to solve problems on a much, much bigger scale、uh, and the important、uh, role that DevRel can actually play within that. So I'd like to tell you a story about this project in particular. Um, which is a quest to do transformation across a whole sector and a whole section actually of society in the UK. So, just to give you a little bit of background,、um, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail because we don't have much time.、Um, but in England, where I live, almost 18 million adults don't exercise enough to improve their health and well being. And these are stats that come from an annual survey done by a body called Sport England. Um, they do、uh, what's called their Active Lives survey. And there are actually different ways that、um, people around the world, or even in England itself, judge、uh, what constitutes being active. So it's sometimes hard to compare data sets directly.、Um, but I did actually find this, hopefully, study、uh, for Japan, which looks at it in a slightly different way. But at the top level,、um, the rate of、uh, people who have a habit of exercise is 35.1% for men and 27.4% of women. So, similarly, people aren't actually getting that much exercise.、Um, and this is important because physical health can have a huge impact on、um, your well being generally, your mental health, your happiness, and actually society as a whole. Because if,、uh, if the population isn't healthy, then that can cause some problems. And this point about women being less active than men is also really important, and it's something we see in the UK too. Because most people,、um, women very much so, tell you that they know exercise is good for you, and they know that they should do more of it.、Uh, but there are lots of blockers to stop them. So those might be emotional barriers, so fear of kind of being judged, like, oh, you know, I'm too fat, I shouldn't be wearing lycra, I shouldn't be getting all sweaty. Um, but there are a lot of practical barriers as well because、um, it's hard to find opportunities to do things、uh, in the same way that we're kind of used to in other sectors. So that discoverability、um, is really lacking. And once you've found something to do, it's also really important for people to be able to relate to that and make that commitment that, yes, this is something that suits me, that I want to be able to do. Um, because we're very lazy people as humans,、uh, you know, not anybody in particular, but we want to remove effort from our lives. Technology has got us used to that. So, the travel industry is a very good example of this. And、uh, if you search for a holiday online or a hotel or transport, you can find a whole range of different ways to actually access that information. 
Um, they might have maybe different prices or different packages, but it's all based around the same information being shared from the travel providers um, according to agreed standards um, and then surfaced in a variety of different places for people to access. But with physical activity, it's very, very different. And in the UK, the sector is lagging really far behind. So if I want to actually find something to do, um, I will usually have to know that that thing exists. I might have to go onto their individual website to book it or to find out a timetable. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, it's a very specific relationship already. You're having to go um, to one place. And if you don't know about uh, the thing that you want to do yet, if you maybe want to do something in London uh, with a child and it's a lot more of a kind of vague search term, people will typically uh, just be at the mercy of Google and you might get back lots of sort of curated results, um, so like a time, art, a time out article, um, so you know editorial content rather than uh, structured data. So we do actually have finder tools. Those are very limited typically because people have to put in place individual sharing agreements for the data that they're sharing. Um, so they, they don't kind of have this huge range that we're used to in other sectors. And often you can't book as well, a really, really important point. So it's very fragmented. There's a lack of standards as to how everybody's interacting. And there's also a lot of inequality because most focus um, where you can actually access uh, opportunities through generic tools is on gyms, is on very much sporty things, uh, which is a small, small section. Um, and it's just as important to be able to provide support for people with other needs. So people who might have disabilities, people who have uh, uh, particular social requirements, uh, people who um, might be slightly older, and support everything right through from gyms through to more kind of recreational activities and opportunities. And another kind of uh, way that there's inequality is around uh, geography. I live in the middle of the countryside in England and there's much less to do than there is in London. Um, and also things like socioeconomic groups, um, they're typically uh, less active generally. So, to try to solve this, uh, a movement started and it was to encourage change through better access to opportunity data, sparking innovation and hopefully better experiences for people. And what was done was Open Active was created, which is a community-led initiative, which is really important. Um, but it's led by the Open Data Institute in the UK, who are an independent, not-for-profit body. And they basically act as kind of the hub to control everything and get the momentum going. And it's supported by Sport England, who um, did that survey, who provide funding at the moment. And uh, Sport England's mission is that everybody in England feels able to take part in sports uh, and activity, regardless of their age, background or ability. And that's something that's very much shared by Open Active. And so what does this actually mean? Well, the idea is basically um, to use open data and to get people um, to embrace that, uh, to uh, basically feed the rest of the ecosystem. And if you're not familiar with open data, it's basically data that anybody can use, uh, reuse or share, and anybody can use that uh, for any purpose. So you want to get that data out there. You want to make it accessible to people in the broader sense. And also, we needed to install some technical standards so that everybody is working in the same way. We could have some nice interoperability. So the idea is, by getting data to flow better between these parties, so you've got the, the activity providers, and you've got uh, people who can make stuff with the data, and then you've got the members of the public who are hopefully going to use these products and services, um, that we can bring benefits to everybody. There's no downsides, basically. And this means making it look more like the travel industry, to go back to my previous slides. Um, we've got uh, the activity providers down here. We've got people who might be using products um, to release their data. We've also got people who might be creating their own APIs. They might have in-house developer teams. Um, then they might be uh, you know, having those feeds available for anybody to use, um, or they might be being pulled into an aggregation service. And then eventually they'll be surfaced on websites, apps and digital and get through to people. Um, but it's really important to say that this isn't just digital. I'm a big kind of fan of not thinking um, that everybody has to always be glued to their devices. So it can also be used for community support by people like doctors, um, uh, young mothers support, all those kind of things as well. 
So just to reiterate, this is kind of things like, I want to find a tennis court, I want to find a yoga class, I want to find a group to go walking with. It's not personal data, it's not what people have done, it's not about individuals, it's about opportunities to get active, basically. But as you can imagine, getting an entire sector who isn't really very good at digital literacy to change can be tricky because you need the APIs, you need the infrastructure, and you need to change the mentality as well. So we needed developers to actually turn this idea into reality. And there's been a ton, ton, ton of work on this, and I've just been a little, little piece. Um, so there's all kinds of work around communications and engagement to get people sold on the idea itself. Um, but what I'm going to talk to you about today is actually making it happen. and. Um, doing the work basically both of publishing and consuming the data, uh, making sure that the data is good quality, supporting the team because that core team was actually very small, so we needed to kind of automate as much and let people self-serve as much as possible. And then you might have noticed in the title of my talk I mentioned sustainability, so actually kind of making this something that can feed itself and uh, continue into the future. Uh, so the program was structured as an overall piece, but this is a really nice diagram that uh, my colleague actually referenced a lot when he was putting together some thoughts initially on the developer-centric bits of it. Um, so this is from Influitive.com, and it's a really great structure to follow um, in terms of this hierarchy of developer success needs. Um, so when you think about sustainability, this is also really, really important as to how you actually want to support people. And this project wasn't your everyday kind of challenge. It certainly wasn't my everyday challenge, but it was really the start of me thinking a lot more about DevRel and how to do it better in the other work that I do. Um, and the work that I did on this project sparked some thoughts that I've applied since. So what I like to do is share some of the learnings uh, from this project, but some of the tools as well that might be useful to some of you today. Um, it's particularly relevant for community projects and uh, a lot of it focuses on the developer experience side. So the first one, as Tamami-san uh, pointed out this morning, uh, there are lots of good points about DX, but a really, really important point here is knowing who you're speaking to, who are the developers you need to get through, and Flacky kind of touched on that as well. Because you don't want to make assumptions about who your audience is, uh, what they do or don't know, and you don't want to lump everybody into that same group of, um, you know, not all developers are the same, and not all communities are the same. Uh, ISN also gave us some really good examples of things to think about within the context of, of Japan in particular. So has anybody seen the, the MailChimp persona posters? Uh, they're, they often get shared around. They're really beautiful um, and they're used as these you know, different personas of different types of people. But these reflect how MailChimp see their audience. Uh, and in my experience, this is a very different view of a developer to the one that we had for our audience and traits like savvy, mobile, educated, they were not necessarily always the case, and there definitely wasn't one view of what a developer was. Uh, we were catering with, uh, well, for people with very, very different degrees of technical skills. So there's everybody from expert developers who might be employed by a company, um, they might already be working on booking software, things like that. They might be employed for agencies who get contracted to create APIs. But then on the other end of the scale, there are people who maybe run uh, small village tennis courts and might use pen and paper or they might have a website that they update maybe once a month that it's just a hobby and they don't know about any of the latest techniques they barely know uh, you know how to do anything it's just a hobby for them a side thing they're volunteers so what is uh, what some people think of as the real basics is completely unknown to others and it's always worth making sure that you're not excluding anybody for any reason and I really like Brad Frost's article on this. Uh, there's a link down there. Um, it's a reminder uh, where he basically talks in this about how the word just makes him feel like an idiot. And he's saying things like just update your Ruby gems, just generate a new SSH key, just run a Git rebase. This doesn't actually uh, help a lot of people out there who aren't as familiar with these things as you are. So really be careful with that wording. We did a lot of work to speak to people to make sure we were being careful of this. And um, we identified people 
who had uh, different interests, different needs. We did interviews. Um, we thought about wording. Uh, we were really, really careful to try to do things like when we have uh, blog posts, I tried to explain what APIs were without just using the word API because there were different audiences there. Uh, and Tomomi, again, actually spoke about presenting information appropriately. So thinking about um, what you can do at a basic level and what's easy for you to do, but whether you can then enhance that through videos or giving people different options to consume information. And there's a really, really nice reference here that, uh, again, my colleague Lee found, which is basically a quadrant of how um, you can structure your content uh, in different ways for people doing things at different times. So uh, we've got some tutorials, how-to guides, explanations, and references. And there's a little thing down here saying when these are actually more useful to people in different situations. So this has helped me immensely in terms of how I think about presenting my information. But it's not just about communicating externally to developers as well. And it's really important to communicate well between teams. Uh, I spoke at a conference last year where uh, Jessica Lord was speaking, and she talked through a really, really simple solution to some problems that she was having, which is using um, Google Sheets as a back end, essentially, to power some applications. Um, so I was playing around with this, and I created a really simple little glossary, uh, which will hopefully play, yes. Um, and all this did was to help me coming onto the project and listening to all these people saying words and terms that I didn't understand. Uh, I could capture them into a spreadsheet. But what I could also do was um, tag people in this. I could um, add in terms that I wanted other people to fill in. And the good thing is it's extremely accessible. You know, I haven't had to build a GUI for people who don't actually understand uh, you know, how to maybe uh, use Markdown or GitHub or anything like that. They're used to things like Google Sheets and you can create something really, really quickly. Okay, and the next one is to get people excited. Uh, it's such an important point, is you want people to kind of really want to work with your product. Um, so I'm gonna come on to some more practical things in a minute, but the most, thing, uh, the most important thing here is, I think, making it fun. So we know that there's different types of developers, and uh, we've talked about that. We uh, need to think that data, in particular, can be quite abstract for some people. So if you can give them sandboxes and things to play around with, then they're much more likely to engage with it, to get excited about it. Um, so we, we want to spark ideas. We want people to kind of get, you know, get mucking in, get thinking about what they can do. And this comes back to the use cases of what people can do with your, with your service, with your product, whatever it might be. Um, and we, uh, we, I put together a lot of use cases which looked at um, the different ideas we had, but then also shared that with the community to get them thinking more about what the potential is, what the gaps are, um, helping them to visualize it again. But I also did some more stupid stuff. Uh, at the time, I started playing around with neural networks, uh, quite uh, influenced by Dan Hon, who I've referenced in there. Um, and this was just to take the data sets that we had, so lots of activities, um, lots of activity names as well, uh, to throw it into a neural network and see what it came out with in terms of making up some new activity names. And these are the kind of things that it got back after just, I think it was like one or two passes. So I really like how you've got uh, obviously less physically active things, hand art, not sure if that's a sport, but apparently it's a good idea. And it's even used things like the trademarks. So you've got Fuero TM, which sounds like it could be some hot gym class, maybe, I don't know, running in Tokyo summers or something like that. Um, and it sort of come up with a load of really interesting things that uh, I shared it out and people were kind of going through the list and picking out the ones they like. So again, engage with people in more fun ways. And another thing I did was uh, just to take the activity list we had, because did you know there's not a standardized list of activity names? Everybody uses a different one and there's tons and tons of activity names for swimming. Um, and this basically was to show people the breadth of some of the terms that we had. So you've got your top level of categories uh, in the inside ring, and then all of the outside segments are actually uh, the kind of the subcategories underneath it. So this was very much to, to show people the breadth of the activities that we were dealing with. And the next one is improving discoverability and usability. So if people can't find whatever you want them to work with, they can't use it. Um, and if they can't use it, uh, then they definitely can't use it. 
So um, this is of your thing, uh, your product, your service itself, whatever it might be, but also of the resources that you are uh, trying to get people to use. Um, and we thought about this a lot when we were actually redeveloping the website at the end of last year and did a lot of discovery work in particular around it. So these kind of activities specifically focus around the developer experience, how best to support people. And uh, we, we were thinking very much again about the goals, the tasks that people had, what they needed to achieve and how we could support them. And we did a lot of thinking about what other people were doing well. So um, these are a couple of examples of things we looked at. So the Stripe documentation, they've got um, a thing here. You can see where it says, try the Stripe API in seconds. Um, they've got some very quick uh, examples of getting up and running. And similarly, um, the Contentful website gives you a way to actually play around um, with the JSON on the homepage, like dive straight in. And what I really like about these kind of things is that you can go through, you can pull out individual ideas and kind of create a mood board for everybody um, and apply that to your own documents. So even if you've got things online at the moment, I'd really recommend that you think about what other people are doing, what they're doing well. And another thing is there's some great tools around there, like Glitch, I love Glitch. It's so friendly very easy for people to support each other as well. So there are loads of tools um, for people to get up and running very quickly, start playing around. So think about that broad accessibility of whatever you've got um, that you want to share. Uh, this is another example about supporting people at different levels. Um, so regardless of what you think about Uber, they have um, some bits on their website which allows you to basically um, pick a solution that matches your level of experience and the level of customization you want. So this is very much kind of getting people up and running quickly again. And this matches the, um, that quadrant of the different developer types. Um, so there's different approaches that you can actually take depending on your skill levels. And then on the community side, you sometimes might need to formalize this a little bit and think about the structure that you have. So what we did was we had online meetings every two weeks and there's a video catch-up, you can see them all on the site. Uh, we actually wrote specs according to the W3C process for defining transfer mechanisms for data and the structure of that as well. And uh, we used the group, the community group, to help define the scope, to help define priorities. Um, and we needed to reflect the community because this is a community initiative, so it couldn't be dictated. It did need some leadership, but it also had to be bottom-up as well. And thinking about the scale and sustainability. Um, so the goal is very much that this becomes the norm for the sector. And anybody working on any kind of activity management system should build in the ability for that data to be shared as open data. Um, booking systems will include an API uh, to be able to receive bookings from any, any particular source. Um, but the funding for this won't be uh, you know, forever. The ODI won't be involved forever. And even then, even now, when it is being funded, when there is that core team, you're still very reliant on people. Um, so there's a limit to what people can actually do. And what you don't want to do is you don't want to burn out because you're only one person. And if you are working overly hard or not effectively enough, um, you need to think about how best to use your time. So it's really, really important to think about um, how you can actually get other people to support you in your work as well. So I've just got a few things um, that we did think about um, in terms of how we can best do that. So with the website, the vision for it was to build um, an architecture that was accessible to people in different situations. So um, for developers who were comfortable, there was a workflow where it's a, a Jekyll site that's hosted on GitHub pages. Um, so that's kind of you know, quite a standard workflow for, I think, people in the room that they might be comfortable with. But then we knew that there would also be people who were not comfortable with tools like GitHub, um, with using things like Jekyll. So what we did was we introduced um, a SiteLeaf interface, which is a, a nice little um, CMS which sits over the top. And there's a bi-directional workflow so that actually changes can be made um, in both ways. And another thing was to talk about it. Uh, we got in, I don't know if you've got Net Magazine in Japan, um, but we actually got a case study in there. So this is a, a magazine that's aimed at developers. We talked about our choices. We talked about how things like pattern libraries, we created a pattern library to let the community actually take 
front end uh, patterns and uh, basically apply those to tools that they were creating. So uh, we wanted people to know the mentality behind why we've done things the way that we had. Uh, we wanted people to give, that, uh, to give them the opportunity to basically feed in um, and you know, provide some feedback as well. And finally, we also have a team of champions. So uh, we're hearing a lot about um, how you can actually build communities, how you can build evangelists within teams as well. So there is a program that's going on um, where there is a group of people around the country who are basically doing that work. They are, they are basically sort of engaging with their own existing communities and, and sharing the word there. So it's really, really broad in terms of the kind of engagement that was happening. So this project would not have been possible without the work that developers have done, getting them on board, getting them to help. And in terms of the success, it's not easy, you know, it's not finished, it's not uh, something that's going to be overdone, uh, sort of done overnight. Um, but in terms of some of the, the progress that we've made, these are some of the sessions. I think this is actually back um, from February, but this was uh, a sort of spread of the data that we've got and the geographical ties. Um, so I think it was, uh, we've currently got 96.4 thousand sessions every month being published, which is excellent. And uh, just generally, everybody here is in a different situation. We heard there are people already working in DevRel, there are people who are sort of thinking about it, and there's probably people like me who do some bits but wouldn't consider yourself to be one. Um, so essentially, all we're trying to do is uh, communicate better and work better together. And um, in the work that I, that I do do, the sort of transformation and change work, Developers play such an important part in that, and I hope that some of the things I've shared today will be useful for you, um, and that you can actually take away some of the tools. So I'm going to put my slides online later, um, but if anybody's got any questions, I'm going to be over in the little uh, speaker bit after the talk, so uh, please do come and say hello, or my contact details are down here behind me, helpfully, um, or please come and ask me uh, if you want to talk about anything later. So, how are you going to